The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. In preparing for today, I read a little prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my Cuisinart to keep. I pray my socks are on the rise and that my analyst is wise. That all the wine I sip is white and that my hot tub's watertight. That racquetball won't get too tough. That all my sushi's fresh enough. I pray my cordless phone still works, that my career won't lose its perks, my microwave won't radiate, and my condo won't depreciate. I pray my health club doesn't close, and that my money market grows. If I go broke before I wake, I pray my Volvo they won't take. This funny, tongue-in-cheek prayer represents someone's idea of what's important. Important things in a privileged life. Our gospel message that I just read forces us to look at our lives and ask ourselves, what's really important? The scripture tells the story of a man who has plenty, even more than plenty. And what does he do with those bountiful blessings? This passage is very relevant to us today because most people here in the U.S. have made their priority in life the attainment of enough money to live a good life. We live in a very blessed country with one of the highest living standards in the entire world. The life that most people live here in the United States is far beyond most of the world. Here are some startling statistics that may put our blessings into perspective. If you or anyone in your family has an education and know how to read, then you are more blessed than over 2 billion people in the world that cannot read anything at all. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, You are more blessed than the million who won't survive this week. If you have food in your refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than more than three quarters of the world. If you have money in your bank, in your wallet, and spare change lying in a dish, you are among the top 88% of the world's wealthy. If you can attend church like you are today and don't have to fear harassment, arrest, torture, or death, you are more blessed than almost 3 billion people 
in the world. It's amazing how humbling this realization is to know that the poorest of us in this room are richer than most of the rest of the world. And yet, do we have enough? We sit and we watch TV programs like Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, House Hunters International, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and shows on the Disney Channel where we're bombarded by advertisements showing us something bigger, something better, and something different. In our society, the distance between being comfort comfortable and covetous may not be that great. This is what Jesus was trying to tell us in our scripture. When does having possessions become a sin, a sin we need to change? In that gospel lesson from Luke, we find Jesus teaching his disciples and many others who were interested in his teaching. He was trying to teach his disciples to fear God and God alone. When suddenly he was interrupted by a man who was not trying to learn, but who needed guidance with his own problem. This man blurts, Teacher, can you tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me? I'm sure Jesus stopped what he was teaching and looked over at this man and then said, Man, who made me a judge, an arbitrator over you? Jesus then refused to be sidetracked from his mission by seeking and saving the lost. He looked at that man and saw that the problem wasn't the fair division of his inheritance, but one of greed. Jesus said that, saw that not only did this man have a problem with greed, but also with his brother. Jesus knew that no settlement would be satisfactory until both brothers had a change of heart. A change of heart is what made Jesus' teaching so different. He knew that everything that comes from man starts in their heart. What Jesus saw coming out of this man's heart was greed. So he begins to teach about the sin of greed in the parable of the rich man. I don't believe that Jesus had a problem with a man accumulating possessions and being wealthy. But what Jesus was concerned with was the man's heart. Is your heart turned toward getting more and more of what you already have? Or is your heart bent on loving and giving where it's needed? Then starting in verse 16, Jesus gives us five principles of what happens when our heart begins to focus exclusively on ourselves and we become greedy. The first principle when we focus on ourselves, we do not give God the credit for things that he has done. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded bountifully. Jesus spoke of a man who was rich, a man who had honestly earned what he possessed. Jesus didn't have a problem with that. Jesus was speaking of a man who was leaving God out of the picture. He was speaking of a man who was saying to himself, Wow, look what I've done. Look at what my fields have yielded. Look at me and my wonderful problem. Where was God in the picture? The fact that he was a steward over all that God had given him, that God had blessed him with a good crop, free of blight and disease, the fact that God had blessed him with such an abundance that his cup overfloweth. His barns could no longer hold all that God had given him. This man was not giving God any credit for what he had done. The second of five principles is that when we focus on ourselves, we make plans but leave God out. The man thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store all of my crops? So he said, I, I think I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna tear down my barns and build better ones. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. There really is nothing wrong with the man's desire to build more barns. It was probably smart, but the problem lays in the fact that there's not any thought of sharing his abundance with others. It's interesting to note that in the parable, the personal pronoun my occurs
occurs four times, and I occurs five times. The rich man says, my props, my barns, my goods. There's no thought of putting God into his life. In all his plans, he's left God out of the picture. The third principle is when we focus on ourselves, we consider spending our resources only on ourselves. And I say to my soul, you have many goods laid out for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In this verse, the man is talking to himself and assessing his future physical well-being. This man thought that when he put his plan into action and that he would have made it for years to come, he was convinced, convinced that his future would continually expand under his, his control. Nothing could be further from the truth. He was beginning to show traits of being a fool. When we speak of the future, we should shift. We should say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. The Bible does not discourage us from looking into the future. However, as we make our plans, whether it be in business, in relationships, in our own personal lives, we are to do so from the perspective that ultimately God is the one in charge. With this in mind, we should plan with a humble heart, knowing God is with us to help us and strengthen us in all that we do. The fourth principle is when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we store our treasures in the wrong places. God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? God is calling this rich man a fool. In scripture, a fool is one who leaves God out of any consideration. A person becomes a fool when they begin to think that all they have and all that they accomplish and all that they possess is because of what they do. I don't think Jesus really had a problem with us or has a problem with us owning things. This is one that way that God blesses our lives. It's how we think about them, our possessions, that makes the dif difference. It's very hard not to become emotionally attached to things in our lives. One experience related to this is very fresh in my own memory and happened just this week. About 20 years ago, my parents moved from our family farm to a home in Mountain Lake, Minnesota. Recently, they sold their home and are moving into a one-bedroom assisted living facility in another neighboring community. As you can probably well imagine, my parents have accumulated a lot of possessions in their 55 years of marriage and in the raising of five children and 16 grandchildren. As my mom and I were sorting and packing the earthly remains of their homemaking, we realized she was parting with so many things that God had provided. It's pretty amazing how God's absolute truth quiet, quick, quietly slips up on you and can lead to a moment of clarity. Together we realize that you can't take it with you, that God blesses you with many things, but they're only on loan for you to use, that you are only a steward of the things that you have here in life. Lastly, the fifth principle is when we focus on ourselves, we will find ourselves in conflict with God's plan for our lives. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Riches have one major weakness. They have no purchasing power after death. All our earthly riches will do us no good once we all we own is a six-foot plot of ground, unless our riches are used to help others, unless we use our abundance to bring others to the belief that giving is better than getting, that God blesses the giver and places treasures in his house for the righteous person. Until we can come to this realization, we have not brought God into our lives. We have not opened our eyes to what Jesus taught 
and we are not living as Christians. When we started out this morning, looking at our many earthly riches, all of our privileges, and then discussing how Jesus told the parable of the rich man, we think about what's really important in life. It seems like there's two options for us. A, do we want to live a life that's depending, dependent on things in this world? Or B, do we want to live a life knowing that treasures await us in heaven, knowing that we have a bond with God, our Creator? There's no escaping the fact that we are part of this world, but we shouldn't stop, that shouldn't stop us from realizing that we are also part of God's great universe. Even though we are immersed in daily cares and concerns of life, we should know that this life and everything in it has been given to us by a loving and caring Father. So our decision comes down to that one simple question. Are you going to live for yourself or for God? Amen.